a couple of words about uh, how I uh, I become interested in the issue of uh, Xinjiang and, 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 and Uyghurs. Um, my original research was uh, was done on, uh, in fact, the London School of Economics some 35 years ago on, on China and the Middle East, or the Middle East and Chinese foreign policy. And afterwards, I tried to find all kinds of connections between the Middle East, between the issue of Islam, between the issue of, say, arms sales and so on, and, uh, uh, and China. And uh, I wrote something uh, about Chinese arms sales and uh, defense modernization. And then I, I, uh, I become interested in the, in the issue of Xinjiang uh, because of, of the Muslim population and because of uh, relations that were supposed to be between uh, Xinjiang and Uyghurs and Middle Eastern countries and so on. And this is how it all started. Now, uh, in China it was quite difficult to, as many of you know, it was very difficult to do research in, inside China. And the way I, I uh, did it at the beginning, I, uh, I accompanied the, the tourist groups as a, as a guide. And, uh, you know, uh, going along the, 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 the Silk Road. And uh, uh, this enabled me to visit uh, Xinjiang, some some cities, you know, Kashgar and, and Lumchi and, and other, uh, other cities, uh, Turufa, uh, without uh, attracting too much uh, attention. Um, I, but inside China it was a little uh, difficult, so I, I become much more interested in the uh, Uyghur diaspora, in Uyghur communities outside, outside China. And uh, I got a research grant from the MacArthur Foundation a few years ago, and I visited the Uyghur communities in many countries in the world, you know, in Australia, in, in Central Asia, in Turkey, in Europe, uh, in the United States, in Canada, and, and, and so on, several communities more than once. And eventually there will be a book about the Uyghur diaspora, uh, which is going to take some time, because it's not written yet, but part, parts of it uh, are. So this is how I become interested in the issue of uh, uh, Uyghurs communities outside outside uh, uh, China. Now Turkey was a special case. Turkey was very much interesting because it used to be the center of uh, of uh, Uyghur what we call transnationalist activities. Uh, it was the headquarters of the Uyghur national movement, and I noticed that uh, uh, the Turkish government has changed its policy toward the, uh, toward the Uyghurs over, over time, especially since the mid-1990s. And I was quite interested or intrigued by this, uh, by this change. And this is uh, uh, how I came to study a little more these relations between China and Turkey and against the background of, of uh, Uyghurs in, uh, in, in Turkey. And uh, hopefully this is going to be published uh, shortly. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know yet, but I hope it will be, because I already said it. So, anyway, so let me start now with the uh, with the topic uh, 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 itself. I would like to begin by uh, an incident that uh, took place in January 2003. I was invited to a conference in uh, in Ankara. Uh, maybe some people remember this conference. Uh, it, it was supposed to be from the 13th to 16th of January. 2003, um, in Uyghur conference. And uh, I think about 24 <coughs> hours before, 48, shortly before it was supposed to be held, the, the conference was suddenly cancelled. And the reason was that at that time, the newly elected Prime Minister of Turkey, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, visited China. He visited China for the first time, heading a huge delegation of maybe one, <coughs> 100 businessmen. And uh, this was shortly after he was elected. And apparently, he did not want to upset the Chinese. Uh, that while he was in China, there was a conference, an Uyghur conference in Ankara, the capital of Turkey. So uh, the order was to cancel, to cancel the conference, which is, of course, typical of the change that uh, has taken place in Turkey uh, since uh, since uh, then, and a little before. Now, the interesting point is, of course, that it, this is the same Erdogan who, in July 1995, while he was mayor, mayor still mayor of Istanbul, he uh, set up a, a, a new park, or in fact a corner of a park. If you know, I don't know if anybody 
here was, was in Istanbul, you know, Sultan Ahmed uh, Park in Istanbul. So he uh, uh, set up a, a corner of this park named after Isa Yusuf Abdekin. And Isa Yusuf Abdekin, of course, is, was uh, uh, the great leader of, uh, of the uh, Uyghurs ever since he escaped uh, 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 from China in, uh, in 1949 and certainly in Turkey, and I'll say a few words about him later on. So, a corner of the park was named after him, and not only that, there was a memorial erected, uh, you know, in memory of the, uh, so to speak, uh, East Turkestani martyrs, and you should know the difference between East Turkestan and Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang is a Chinese name. Uh, this is the region, the region of uh, Western China, Northwestern China, was known as uh, Xinjiang since the middle of the 18th century and, and became a province, uh, officially became a province in 1884. But the Uyghurs call this region East Turkestan, uh, or Dongtu in, Ch uh, uh, in Chinese. So there was a memorial commemorating those uh, Nazis uh, killed by the Chinese over, over, the, over the years. And also there were citations uh, of uh, uh, of uh, you, you know of, of uh, speeches and so on that criticize the Chinese Chinese behavior toward to the um, uh, Uyghurs Chinese attempt to assimilate Uyghurs and so on, and so on and the one responsible for this was the same Erdogan who in two or three that's eight years later uh, 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 canceled this conference so what happened let's say between uh, 1995 and 2003, that made Erdogan uh, change his mind about about Uyghurs. So this is, in fact, the topic of this of this talk. Um, I would like to start with a very brief historical background uh, about relations between Turkey and China, or pre-modern China, or the, Ch the, the Chinese Empire and the, the, the Ottoman Empire. We don't have any extensive evidence, written evidence, records about relations between these two empires, which is, seems to be very, very odd. And if any one of you is thinking about doing a PhD, uh, uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, um, you have to know classical Chinese, of course. You have to know uh, Ottoman Turkish. Otherwise, everything is easy. <laughs> and and, and, uh, and uh, because that in Chinese records, we find the name of uh, Lumi, you know Lumi? Lumi is, is Rum, or Rumeli, which some parts of the Turkish Empire uh, were called by. And, and, uh, but otherwise, there are no indications of the real exchanges between a pre-modern Turkey and pre-modern uh, and pre-modern uh, uh, China. Now, the first indication of such an exchange came in the uh, 1870s during the uh, Yakubek Rebellion. I, I assume you know something about that. But Yakubek uh, set up his own state in, in near in Kashgar, in fact, uh, in uh, Xinjiang or Eastern Turkestan. I, I'm going to say Xinjiang because it's shorter. That's uh, no political <laughs> views in, implied. Uh, so, uh, so uh, during Yakubek uh, rebellion against against China, um, he asked the uh, uh, the, the uh, Turkish uh, the uh, Ottoman Sultan to send some, some help, and uh, uh, the Sultan sent some officers uh, to, uh, um, um, to Kashgar, um, and uh, also sent some money and ammunition, weapons, and, and, and so on, uh, and also issued a firman, you know, a firman, which is a decree, uh, uh, saying that uh, this state is in fact part of the Ottoman Empire, and we have all these documents. Uh, uh, and these are these documents are available. So um, also he sent him uh, um, a flag, and he gave him permission to mint some you know coins, uh, which means that in his perception this state was part part of the Ottoman uh, part of the Ottoman um, uh, Empire. Later on, um, pictures were sent to China to to Xinjiang, uh, and they and they. Uh, taught courses according to the um, uh, Turkish curriculum. The point is, of course, that except for these symbols of authority, 
the Turks have done nothing to support, really support this state of uh, 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 Yakubek, and then it collapsed after after a few after a few years. It, collect, it collapsed after two, uh, uh, after <coughs> two years. And when we move on, whenever there was something to do with Uyghurs or you know self determination, like like the uh, Eastern Turkestan Islamic Republic of 1933. Um, and certainly, uh, during the uh, Eastern Turkestan Republic of 1944-1949, uh, uh, um, while, while Turkey, especially in 1933, really identified with this uh, uh, republic, so to speak, and, and, uh, and uh, was quite enthusiastic about it, uh, n nothing was really done to support the, the republic, and it collapsed after a few, after a few weeks. The Eastern Turkestan Republic of the 1940s was under the influence of the Soviet Union, and Turkey has nothing, has nothing to, to say about it at all. Um, if you think about the uh, um, Chinese communist attitude, the Chinese communists were not so uh, interested in, in Turkey, um, except, you know, Mao Zedong, uh, uh, I think, in the 1920s, planned to write a book about nationalist uh, movements all over the world, and he mentioned also the uh, uh, the Turkish uh, national movement, and also in the 1930s, uh, he tried to, to enlist the support of uh, Muslim nationalities in uh, in China, support revolution and so on, uh, and uh, and also, but otherwise than that, there was no no uh, no interest at, uh, at all. 1949, October 1949, the, the uh, Chinese People's Republic was established. There were no relations between China and Turkey at the time. Turkey did not recognize the, uh, the People's Republic of, of China. And as you know, soon afterwards, the Korean War erupted. This was in June 1950. And uh, uh, Turkey decided to, to join the Allies, to join, in fact, the United Nations forces that were, that were composed mainly of US, US forces, some other countries, and so on. And the reason Turkey decided to join this effort against North Korea and against China, China intervened in the war later in, in October. Uh, the reason was uh, had nothing to do with, with, with China or North Korea. The main reason was to get into NATO. This was the main reason. And the Turks, uh, uh, the Turkish government at the time thought that by, by supporting the alliance effort in, in Korea, they would manage to get into NATO, and they were right, because in 1952, uh, uh, Turkey uh, joined NATO. Not the European Union, of course, but, but NATO. Uh, um, Chinese, uh, they, the Turkey, Turkish government sent uh, altogether about 25,000 troops to, uh, to fight along the uh, UN forces in, in Korea, in, you know, in shifts, not, not all at once. And they lost, I think, more than uh, 700 casualties People were killed. The Turkish people were killed. Turkish soldiers were killed in, uh, in in Korea, and this confrontation between China and Turkey in in the Korean War left some you know kind of sediments of of, uh, of hostility um, in Turkey that survived till today, uh, because at that time uh, the the. And the confrontation, there were very you know, kind of bloody confrontation between Chinese troops and Turkish troops in uh, uh, in Korea, um, and the uh, the Turks uh, had very kind of uh, uh, let's say bad feelings and bad words to say about Chinese communism, about the mass of peasant, ignorant peasant. It, they said it, and so and so on. So there is this kind of of uh, attitude that remained as remained over over uh, over the years. Now these were even exacerbated later on when Turkey joined the, you know, the Baghdad Pact, Baghdad Pact, organized by the United States, and later on CENTO, Central Treaty Organization, which was directed mainly, of course, against the Soviet Union, but also against China. From Beijing's point of view, it was directed against, against, uh, against China, and uh, uh, and of course uh, uh, the Chinese uh, criticized Turkey all over the years, especially in 1950s and 60s during the Cultural Revolution for identifying with the West and the United States especially. Then there was a change, and the change came in uh, 1970. In August 1970, Turkey decided to recognize China. The question is why? 
what happened in 1970 that made Turkey recognize China after so many years and, and, and so, you know, painful memories. There were internal and external reasons. Internal reasons, the change in China itself, the Cultural Revolution was over. The violent phase of the Cultural Revolution was over uh, by, by uh, uh, 1968, 69. And, uh, and, and um, uh, China began to get you know, kind of, kind of organized after the chaos of the Cultural Revolution. Outside China, of course, there were two uh, uh, developments that affected Turkish uh, behavior. One was the, the growing hostility between China and the Soviet Union. There were some violent clashes between Chinese forces and Soviet troops uh, in Xinjiang, among other things, but also along the Usui and the Amu, you know, the northeastern uh, part of China. And uh, uh, suddenly, the Soviet Union now became the main threat, the most immediate and dangerous threat to China's security. At the same time, the United States began to change its policy toward China. And, uh, and uh, especially after uh, Nixon was elected uh, president, uh, he promised to pull out uh, American troops from Vietnam and to improve relations with, uh, with China. And it was on this basis that Turkey and many, many other governments decided to recognize China at long last, which led later on in October 1971 to the admission of the People's Republic of China into the United Nations and as a permanent member of the Security Council at the expense of, of Taiwan, at the expense of the Republic of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, China. So by August 1970, there were relations between the two countries, official diplomatic relations between the two, the two countries. For the next 20 years, nothing really significant happened between these two countries. In China itself, and I see it now more than ever before, this period of 1970s and especially 1980s was a kind of a transition period. I mean, the Chinese, even after the death of Mao, and if, uh, after, even after the launch of post-Mao reform in China, the Chinese were still not confident that this is the course of, of development in, in China. There was still internal opposition, and there was still all kinds of threat from outside. The Soviet Union still existed at the time, and so on. So it was only after the early 1990s, let's say from 1992 onward, that the Chinese really felt sure, felt confident enough to continue on this course. And this was symbolized by Deng Xiaoping, uh, famous uh, trip to the south of China, he said, we are going to continue, in fact, to continue this reform. Some of these uh, opposing uh, leaders, some of the opposing leaders uh, <laughs> had died in the meantime. Uh, he was lucky to stay alive after them. And I think this was a major reason for the change in Chinese policy, international politics, uh, not only vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, but also against the United States and, of course, in many other regions of, uh, of, of the world. So this was a transition period. China, in the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, um, has become more interested in, in the Uyghur issue. And this is a new element in China's relations toward uh, Turkey, not only to Turkey, also in Central Asia, and also in Europe, and the United States, and Canada, and international organizations um, uh, as well. So I, I want to say a few words now about Uyghur nationalism uh, and how it became involved in this uh, uh, relations, constellation of relations, of China's international relations. Um, there are all kinds of debates about the beginning of Uyghur nationalism. Uyghurs say that they have a history going back 6,000 years and so on. So I don't know, I don't want to start with 6,000 years because we're not going to finish on time. Uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, <coughs> probably what we call Uyghur nationalism began in the late 19th century or early 20th century. Some people say, usually say that it, were, it was the, the outcome of the Soviet uh, 
kind of division of Central Asia after the after the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, uh, and and so they had Uzbeks and Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and so on, Tajiks and so on, and there were Uyghurs who did not have a homeland, they did not have a country, um, and so this was the time when uh, when uh, Uyghur nationalism began, but new research show that uh, shows that. Uh, that probably the beginning, uh, 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 you know, uh, originate uh, much much earlier. Let's say in the second half or, 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 or fourth quarter of the of the 19th century. Um, uh, uh, during these times in the 19th century, especially, and then. Uh, at the beginning of the first half of the, uh, of, the ninth, of the 20th of the 20th century, uh, Uyghurs began to migrate to uh, some of the Central Asian countries, especially that is now called known as, as, as Kazakhstan, and also to other countries. And among them, some of the uh, early figures that moved was uh, um, uh, a man by the name of Mehmet Reza Bekin. I don't know if you know him. Uh, about him, he went in 1930s, uh, he went to Turkey, he attended a, a, a military school in Turkey, he became an officer in the Turkish army, he was a communication officer uh, during the Korean War, so he fought in fact the, the, the Chinese, and then he was promoted and he became a general in the Turkish army. And he is one of the leaders of the international, transnational uh, Uyghur Ma movement, uh, he's, still, uh, he's still living in, in, uh, uh, in Turkey. Um, there were, of course, other people uh, involved with the with, the, uh, uh, with uh, this movement. Uh, I mentioned already Isa Yusuf Altekin, uh, and he and a few hundred of his supporters and some other leaders like Mehmet Emin uh, Buba uh, escaped China in 1949, just ahead of the Chinese troops who occupied what is called as East Turkestan or Xinjiang, uh, with the support of the Soviet uh, Union. So they fled, they fled to, um, uh, to, to India, and after a few years, at the beginning of the 1950s, they moved to, uh, to Turkey. They moved um, uh, uh, to Turkey. Uh, later on, of course, many other Uyghurs left China, uh, either legally or illegally, uh, some left directly, some indirectly, to Central Asia. And with the support of some organization like the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees or the uh, International Red Cross or, or whatever, but these are uh, uh, the, the, this, these are the foundations. I mean, the foundations for this translational movement were laid at the at the uh, early 1950s, and um, Turkey became uh, the headquarters of this of this uh, movement. Uh, Turkey provided uh, Uyghur refugees or migrants or whatever expatriates with uh, the, with citizenship. They could serve in the in the uh, Turkish army. Um, the government or the municipality provided officers free of charge for a variety of uh, Uyghur organizations. There have been a number of uh, publications issued by these organizations over 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 the years. Uh, um, um, for not only for political reasons, but also mainly for the promotion of, of uh, Uyghur uh, culture, you know, literature, and, and, uh, and, and so and, and, and so on. And they had some very good um, international uh, relations network, uh, especially Isa Yusuf Altekin, who was kind of a diplomat. Um, he um, maintained relations with many international organizations, Islamic organizations, uh, NGOs, and, 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 and so on. The other leader, Mehmet Bova, he died in 1964, I think, 1965. And Isa Yusuf Apekin uh, remained the leader for another 30 years. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to that later. Uh, the point is, of course, that all these efforts uh, uh, misfired because, because it, it, was, it was not effective. This, this policy of relations with other organizations were not very effective. You have to remember this was the time of the Cold War, and, uh, and uh, China at that time was isolated. And China was uh, uh, immune, in fact, immune of any, any kind of 
action or retaliation against it. Um, also, at that time, nobody talked about human rights. There were not talk, no talk about, about promotion of democracy at that time. And also the communication uh, or the media was a little you know, well, underdeveloped compared to what we have today. Um, and uh, uh, there were limits uh, on what these leaders could, uh, 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 could, have, could have done. But then, again, there came a change. And the change came in the 1980s, and especially since the early 1990s, as I said, as I said, uh, said before. And the reason for the change, again, there were a number of reasons. Uh, first, it had to do with what was going on in China. In China, Mao Zedong died in 1976. It took a few years, and China began uh, to reform and, and, uh, and uh, adopted an open-door policy. Among other things, all the borders of Central Asia were open. It was a very serious dilemma for China, whether to keep the uh, stability and the border closed, or to open the borders and maybe invite uh, instability. And the Chinese decided to open the border. And there were a flow of population uh, to the other side of, of, of the border. And this was, uh, this was uh, very important. Um, uh, the second, second layer, of course, was the collapse of the dis disintegration of the Soviet Union. The disintegration of the Soviet Union ended up in a number of independent state, and I emphasize independent states. So Kazakhstan became independent, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, and so on. And suddenly, of course, <coughs> the Uyghurs felt they also deserve a homeland, because there are all these minorities are present in, 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 in Xinjiang. There are Kazakhs, Tajik, Uzbek, Kyrgyz, and so, and, and so on. And all they have their own homeland, except for the uh, Uyghurs. So this was an incentive to renew or to resume uh, the struggle for uh, independence or something <coughs> less than independence. Uh, um, another change, of course, was the world now led by the United States uh, suddenly began to promote you know, human rights and democracy. There was a crusade, still is a crusade for the promotion of democracy in many parts of the of, of the world, and also directed against against China, uh, and, and this, of course, brought into focus this struggle of the uh, Uyghurs for for independence, maybe self self determination, and finally, of course, technology has changed a lot. Uh, uh, the main change was, of course, the introduction of the internet, internet, email, and so on, because this facilitated very very easily and relatively very cheaply access to many, many communities and countries and leaders and so on all over the world. It was very, very easy. And at that time, Uyghurs began to set up their own you know, websites. I never counted how many websites, Uyghur websites, there are, but I think over 60 or maybe more uh, websites, Uyghur websites, some in English, some in uh, Turkish, I mean, uh, Uyghur and other languages and, 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 and so on. So suddenly, the Uyghur issue became visible in the world, and people began, began to, to, pay, to pay attention. And also China, you know, because China, and this is very interesting, until the early 1990s, China considered the Uyghur issue uh, China's internal affair. This is an internal issue in which no other government or organization was supposed to interfere. Uh, and, uh, and the Chinese said that they are going to solve the situation in China, because this is a domestic, a domestic issue. But since the early 1990s, the Chinese suddenly realized the dimensions of, of, of the international support for Uyghurs. Now, when I talk about dimensions, it's not that all the world suddenly began to support Uyghurs. But suddenly, the existence of these organizations and the emergence of different associations, Uyghur associations in many countries, especially in the West, and the access they had to the media, to uh, reporters, to correspondents, to governments, to parliaments, and so on, uh, to members of parliament, suddenly, uh, uh, people, people in the West who, who had never known anything about the Uyghurs suddenly began to understand there was a 
problem. There was an, an, an issue. And the Chinese now realized that it is not enough to deal with the issue of, of Uyghurs inside China, but something has to be done also out, outside China. The point is that uh, uh, until the mid-1990s, China was still careful. As I said, the Chinese were not so self-confident about, about themselves. Um, and, um, and, and Turkey simply ignored the Chinese uh, attempts to, to influence its policy towards, uh, towards the, uh, 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 the, the Uyghurs. And quite a number of Turkish politicians and statesmen uh, were in touch with the Uyghur leaders, and they promised them that Turkey would support the Uyghurs and would promote their interest and, 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 uh, and, and so on. And then in those uh, in those years, after 1995, there were huge demonstrations in uh, in Turkey, <coughs> in Istanbul, in in Ankara. Uh, there was some uh, some violence as well. There were press conferences uh, in which the uh, Uyghur issues were uh, were raised. There were responses to events in uh, inside Xinjiang, uh, and, uh, and 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 so on. And suddenly, China was upset by by these uh, these developments. And then again, by the mid-1990s, 1995, we can see a change, a change. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, in China itself, as I said, I mean, by 1995, the Chinese were confident that they are going to proceed with the reforms uh, to build a stronger army. Uh, Russia, former Soviet Union, Russia became China's new ally, which means uh, acquisition of weapons and, and, and political support and so on, and Chinese economy began to grow. Something that was not so certain in the 1980s. Chinese economy uh, began began to grow. So Chinese felt they could do a little more, to, could, could apply a little more pressure on those government which they thought uh, uh, were supporting the, uh, the Uyghurs, especially primarily in Central Asia, because Central Asia was very close to China. But this is not our topic today. Uh, so the Chinese began to apply a little more pressure on, on, the, uh, on the government of, uh, of, of Turkey. Now, I must say at that point that the Turkish policy toward uh, the Uyghurs was not you know, straightforward all the time. Because in Turkey, there used to be there still is this kind of a dilemma between, uh, between Universalist uh, orientations, uh, which regarded uh, all all these nationalities, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Uyghurs, Turkmens, and all, as Turks, they are all Turks, and the Turkish government did not want to uh, create this kind of sub subgroups, but to create a, a whole kind of uh, pan-Turkic, if you wish, uh, pan-Turkic uh, uh, community community. Um, Uyghurs, on the other hand, tried to, try to resist this policy because they wanted to maintain their identity, specific identity, uh, 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 particularistic identity, the language, the habits, and, and memories, and so, and, and so on. So even before the Chinese had begun to apply the, uh, began to apply the, the pressure, uh, this kind of tension had, had begun to emerge in, in, uh, 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 in, in, uh, in Turkey. Um, the problem in Turkey, and we talked about it a little uh, earlier today, the problem in Turkey, paradoxically, is uh, that it is easier, easier for Uyghurs to lose their identity, let's say, in Turkey, than to lose their identity in Germany, or in <coughs> Australia, or in Canada. Because in Australia, in Germany, in Canada, they live in a different society, uh, and they have to somehow to, to isolate themselves to keep their own, their own uh, traditions, uh, their own language, the culture, and so, and so on. In Turkey, it is very difficult because of the similarity of the predominance culture in Turkey uh, 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 and, 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 the, and the very, you know, limited differences between, between Turkish culture and, and, and Uyghur culture. So this was a, uh, one of the reasons why the Uyghurs tried, you know, to, to, to maintain the uh, their, uh, collective, their collective uh, identity. 
But again, I mean, uh, as I said, I mean, Turkey up to this point, Turkey supported, supported the, uh, and then came this incident that I mentioned at the beginning. I mean, the uh, naming of part of the of the park uh, after after Isa Yusuf yeah. uh, Alpiki, which was uh, which was uh, kind of a, a symbol of, of Turkish support. A few months later, this was in July, in December, Isa Yusuf Alpiki died. December. <coughs> 1995, and he was 1995. He was 95. Uh, he was 95 at the time. So we had a long, you know, long life uh, uh, in which he could uh, could affect, you know, Turkish policy, and then relations with with other organizations and 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 later. And the Turkish press said at the time that uh, uh, about one million people participated in his funeral in December 1995, and he was buried. In the national cemetery, Topkapi, uh, along near the graves of of, of, the, of the Turkish presidents, so he was given great honor, mainly by this Erdogan, who was at that time still mayor mayor of of uh, of Istanbul. But after his death, you know, in history. We speak about turning points, turning points. I, I find it sometimes difficult to speak about turning points in history because history is composed of processes. You cannot say that in a certain day something happened that changed the direction of, of historical development. Uh, but there are some, some uh, turning points like that. And I would say that the death of Isa Yusuf Abdekin was such a turning point. It was such a turning point. You could, we would even, you know, hear the relief not only on, in China, in Beijing, because he was considered, as the Chinese called him Aisha, Aisha in Chinese, Aisha. Uh, he was considered China's uh, arch enemy um, and the main obstacle to the development of relations with Turkey. But you could hear the sign, uh, the sign of relief also in, in Ankara. Because, excuse me for saying so, he was a pain in the neck of the Turk Turkish government. Because of his relations with Turkish politicians and parties and opposition parties and president and so on, some of them like Turgut Azal was a good friend of him. He, he, he could get almost anything uh, from him. So now the Turkish government was free to pursue its own China policy. And China, of course, could now proceed and apply more pressure on, on Ankara, knowing that Isa Yusuf Alpegin is no longer there and could change and could change the, uh, the situation. Now, I'm saying that because I know, you know, uh, 10 years later, I'm talking now about 2005, 10 years after his death, uh, his friends wanted to, uh, to have a memorial ceremony uh, in Ankara. And the Turkish government refused. The Turkish government refused. So there was no ceremony. So this is an indication of the changing attitudes uh, on this uh, on this uh, issue. This it reflects the um, uh, 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 reflect the change uh, 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 in the relations between China and uh, and, uh, and Turkey and, and the submission of Turkey to the demands of. Uh, uh, demands of uh, of, uh, of China. Uh, what were the indications or the symptoms of this submission? If you remember, I said that since the 19, early 1950s, Uyghurs who came to Turkey received citizenship. No more. There is no citizenship for Uyghurs in Turkey, right? And uh, and uh, they no longer can serve in the army. And there are all kinds of other uh, demonstrations, for example, are not permitted. Officially, demonstrations are not are not permitted uh, in in, uh, in the demonstration against against um, against China. There were secret instructions to government Turkish government officials not to associate with Uyghur organizations, not to become involved with Uyghur organizations in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Turkey. It was forbidden, still is, 
let's say to uh, uh, to use the, the flags, the Eastern Pakistan flag. I don't know if you know how it looks like. I, I, I have I have a flag like right at home. Uh, so it is forbidden to uh, uh, hang Turkish flag, the Eastern Pakistan flag. One of the outcomes of the change in China's in Turkey's policy to to the Uyghurs was the relocation of many organizations from Turkey to Europe, to Europe and to other countries and uh, North America, because Uyghurs felt no, no longer felt safe in, 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 uh, in, in Turkey, and they moved to other countries, uh, which are democracies that, uh, or in which Chinese could not apply any, any kind of pressure. I mean, there are limits what Chinese can do, let's say, in Germany, or here in the UK, or Canada, or, or the United States. The Chinese cannot, cannot affect the policy of these governments uh, uh, toward the Uyghurs. What they can do in, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, in Turkey. So these are, these are the main indications of the change in, uh, in policy. There are many more indications. Some people are not uh, allowed to, to enter Turkey anymore. Some, I, I mean, Uyghur leaders and so on are not allowed to, to enter Turkey anymore and, and so on. Later, I, I'll qualify what I'm saying now. And I say, I mean, the picture is not so, it's not so dark, it's not so bad. But basically, this is the official policy. Officially, this is uh, the policy. Now, why? Turkey finally submitted to China's uh, pressure. Well, I would like to mention three kinds of reasons. Political reasons, economic reasons, and military reasons. Political reasons. <coughs> Probably in all meetings with Turkish officials, states and politicians and so on, government officials, the Chinese always raised this issue of, of uh, Uyghurs, of the Uyghurs uh, organization and activism in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, always, whenever a, 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 a Chinese, let's say, Prime Minister Li Pang visited, or Zhong Ji visited, and so on, they always raised this issue. So there was a kind of an effect, that the aggregated effect of, of, of pressure on, uh, on, on uh, 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 Turkey. Now, two things additional things reflect, I think, the, the, how Chinese are smart in manipulating the Turkish government. One issue is the Kurds, or the Kurdish problem. Kurdish, the Kurds. Then he is, you know, just hinted that if Turkey would continue to support what they call Uyghur separatism, China would support Kurdish separatism, which is a very significant and, 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 and important problem for, for, for Turkey. As you know, this struggle between China and the Kurdish and the Kurds uh, continue all the time. There is no Kurdish states, state, as, as, as you know. So this was one way how to limit the options standing before the Turkish government. They said, OK, if you support the we will, we will support the Kurds. This is something, of course, that, uh, that uh, uh, Ankara uh, could not have uh, uh, accepted. And secondly, there is another issue, less obvious, but still, which is Cyprus. I mean, Cyprus also. Cyprus, there is a kind of uh, a competition, say, let's say, between, between Greece and, and, and Turkey over the control of Turkey. You know, Turkey is the, uh, over, over the control of Cyprus. And, and you know that Cyprus is divided. And the issue comes before <coughs> the United Nations every now and then. China is not only a member of the United Nations, but a permanent member of the Security Council. And as such, China has uh, the right of veto. And China has uh, a lot of potential power. I'm saying potential because China did not use this, this veto power uh, very, very often. In fact, almost did not use it uh, very, very sporadically. So using this kind of, let's say, veiled threats, against Turkey. This was one major reason why the Turkish government finally submitted to, to China's, uh, to China's uh, uh, demands. <coughs> Secondly, 
and I say people were about economic relations. And I said already that since the establishment of diplomatic relations in 1970, and until about 1990, or the beginning of the 1990s, there was nothing really significant in the relations between the two countries. But since the mid-1990s, the Chinese use what we call, uh, what we can call the economic weapon. The Chinese begin to increase export to Turkey. And just to give you some of the figures, I would say that uh, the Turkish deficit in its, or the Chinese surplus in its uh, uh, trade with Turkey probably reached last year or the year before something like 15 billion US dollars surplus. And how the Chinese do it? They do it the same way they do it everywhere, including here. You just go to a shop and see. Shoes, textiles, whatever. Cameras, everything is made in China. The point is that in, in Turkey, they sell it uh, uh, for very, very, very low you know, prices. Uh, at a certain point of time, the Chinese sold, let's say, a pair of bicycles for $1.8 dollar. $1.8 dollar, which is what, about a pound and something? Yeah? Bicycles. And there were stories about that in the press, which I'll go, I'll, 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 I'll go back in a minute. Uh, um, and among the, they said that every Chinese ship that enters the Turkish port, the Turkish factory has to close down. So the Chinese took control over a section of the, of the economy, of the Turkish economy, in, in some very tradi traditional sectors, I mean, you know, like leather goods. You know, leather goods now, uh, now controlled by China. And Chinese built the, the industrial zones in Turkey, also as a means to enter the European Union, which has some kind of quotas. So uh, uh, economically, uh, although the Turkish are aware of, uh, of the, the growing gap in the bilateral trade with, with China, and they try every year to increase export to China, the Chinese do it much better. I mean, the gap increases over, over time. And, uh, and of course, in this way, of course, Chinese have some influence on, on, the, Turkish, on the Turkish government. Uh, the third, uh, the third uh, issue uh, is the military. And this is something that almost nothing is known about. The issue of military relations between China and, and Turkey. I don't know if any of you know anything about it. But again, uh, over the last... Uh, let's say six, seven years, or even before that, late 1990s, China began to develop relations, promote military relations with Turkey, including cooperation in the development of uh, military technology, and the, the sale of, of, of uh, missile technologies to, to Turkey. Uh, Turkey is now producing a, a number of missiles, short-range missiles, that, uh, that are based on Chinese technologies. And the Chinese uh, uh, um, try to win uh, tenders from all kinds of UAVs, you know, that, uh, and, and so on, competes with other, with other countries. Now, I don't want to say that uh, China has become the main military supplier for, for, for Turkey. This is not true. The United States is still the main supplier. But the Chinese are already there. And they have some leverage on, on, uh, on the Turkish on the Turkish. Uh, Government. Um, so these were the means how to control the Turkish government. Now I would like to conclude. I have a few minutes. I, I would like to uh, uh, to conclude and and say said that um, if we try to look at it objectively, it's it seems as if the Chinese Chinese policy, Chinese policy in Turkey is very very successful. Very successful. As I said, the main situation of the Uyghurs uh, in, uh, in uh, Turkey has 
uh, uh, deteriorated, and with the organization were forced to move out of the country to relocate out to other countries and so on. But in fact, Chinese success is limited, and the Turkish submission is limited. It is not a to it is not a total submission. It is not a total submission, only partially. Uh, uh, and we have to remember something that the Chinese may, may find it difficult uh, uh, to, you know, uh, to understand. Is, is the Turkey is still a democracy? Turkey is still a democracy. Uh, maybe it's a fragile democracy, but it is a, 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 a democracy. It's not a democracy like democracy in, uh, here in the UK, like uh, German democracy, so the United States and Canada, but it is, uh, it, it is a democracy. And in a democracy, of course, you cannot shut the, the mouth of people. I mean, this is why even today, despite all Chinese pressure, there are opposition parties, there are opposition newspapers, and, and there, there is a lot of criticism against China even today because there is a freedom of, of press and there is freedom of speech and there is a freedom of, of organization and association and so on. This is something maybe China uh, may find it very difficult to, uh, to understand. Uh, uh, which is, for China, it's much more easier to do, let's say, in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, which are not really, you know, the democracy in the, in the, in the, even in the Turkish uh, sense of, of, of the word. Uh, secondly, of course, 